Welcome to a new Harry's Garage video and today's car is the BMW X5 45e you see behind me. Quite a mouthful, this is their new generation plug-in hybrid and we had that Range Rover plug-in hybrid in uh, a couple of months ago and even in those two months this sort of area has moved on and I, I've got electric, I've actually got a Tesla coming in a couple of weeks, but I just wanted to revisit this new generation of plug-in hybrid that this car represents with a massively extended range. This does 54 miles on electric. Every, every other plug-in hybrid I look at sort of claim maybe 20 or 30 miles, but they do teens in real life. I'm told this one's very different. And that's why I wanted to have a look at it. Now, a little brief history on the BMW X5. Launched in 1999, I was at Evo, invite came in, BMW all excited, and we were flown out to America, South Carolina, that's where the X5 was built in this new American plant. And Road Atlanta, a fantastic circuit, was up the road, and they launched this car at Road Atlanta. I was with Mark Hales, and we were doing crazy things on track with it. Now, in 1999, you didn't do that with an SUV, BMW were very um, insistent on calling this an SAV, Sports Activity Vehicle, and it came out of a, uh, I think it was 4.4 litre V8 petrol, really tied down, really stiff um, suspension, and it really, it, it wasn't out of sorts on circuit, crazy at the time. You, are, you had to wait another three years before you saw a Porsche KN, and I think it was six years later that the Range Rover Sport rocked up. A long time ago, but it absolutely revolutionized what we thought an SUV or SAV was and sold by the bucket load. And they came out with a three liter diesel, I think in 2000 or 2001, and they were everywhere. They t really took on and it started the SUV craze, you could say. So that's the X5, bit of history. Let's go and have a closer look at this one. If you park a first generation X5 next to this, you're in for a bit of a shot because it has enlarged in all areas this latest one and particularly by that family famous twin kidney grill that you get on BMW. This one is actually sealed. I think it's clever. Um, it's got flaps that um, open when required, but generally it remains closed unless it's really warm or the engine needs cooling or something. Um, and this has got the black shadow line, gloss black shadow line as it's termed, because this has the M Sport package on this car that gives this black outline to the mirrors and grills, etc. 21 inch wheels and a scattering of M badges here, there and everywhere. You can see it on the brake calipers down there and on the side. Um, it's, it's quite a car this, I can't get over the size. I meant to check what exact size it is, but just the interior volume and that sort of thing. This feels Range Rover size rather than Range Rover Sport. Something slightly strange in this car. It doesn't have a catch underneath, it just lifts up. You just pull the um, handle down the footwell twice and then you get to see the engine. Now this is a typical signature BMW engine, um, inline, six cylinder, single turbo, 24 valve, 286 horsepower, set low in the chassis as well. And you get this ridiculous volume under bonnets now and this vastness at the front, just because of the cr um, pedestrian crash um, regulation. Just so many as you're going down here, this sill, right wind up it's got sill extension and if you live in the country all you do is get mud on it every time you get in and out of the car it's a personal wind up on my side it's got a very trick tailgate oh, well. two two part tailgate there and it's really quite a big boot I can't, if you, you can hap i can happily sit behind myself in the rear passenger self a lot of space boot is mild, it's slightly compromised against another it's such a black hole you probably can't see but it's 50 liters smaller than a conventional one you haven't got the seven seat option if you go for the hybrid but in its place you get this monster battery of 24 kilowatt hours put that as perspective that range rover we had in the p400e was actually i think was 13 kilowatt hours so dramatically bigger and that's what gives this car its range Together with the 115 horsepower engine, it totals BMW quote 394 brake horsepower, 600 newton meters torque. That's quite a lot of power for this car, and it gets a bit of a move on. 
and it does very clever things. So I'm going to take it outside now and just show you around the interior. Yeah, so you glide away because it's just about always in electric mode when you set it off like this. Um, what I'm going to do now, I just want to um, get it back down to the house because I want to plug it in because I want a full battery for what we're about to do. But yeah, as soon as you get in, there's a sort of plusness. BMW are very good on the materials. All the levers feels very nice. The buttons are beautifully laid out. There's a sort of crystal on top of the gear lever. I looked, it was actually extra. It's 550 pounds. Um, the start stop button has a little sort of um, cut sort of glass on it as well. It's all very nice. And my phone is charging wirelessly down there as well, which is, yeah, it's all mod cons are all fully included, it seems, in this car. Anyway, I'm going to plug it in and you'll join me in a few, well, about an hour or so. Right. So, as I say, the plan is to do a trip up to Chester now. Now, um, you might have been watching my videos, I'm having this engine done and a few other bits done on the car as well. And I did this run in the Range Rover Sport um, PA plug-in hybrid, the 400E. And I wanna see how this matches to the Range Rover as a comparison. As I say, this has got the bigger battery, it's got more range. I'm looking at 42 mile range on electric at the moment which is more than the Range Rover. Range Rover sort of predicted 22 or something. It actually ended up in the cooler conditions, 18, 19 uh, from its battery. Well, yeah, just a comparison really. So to get going, you press start. It comes up with uh, park and sort of live. You sort of, it's so odd when you've been driving all your life, normal conventionally powered cars. When you start up one of these cars, and there's no sound to say, oh, the engine started. It's all quiet. They all seem to start in electric. The first job I've got to do is put in the address where I'm going because this car has adaptive uh, hybrid for when you put a destination in, it plans the use of electricity in looking at the journey you're about to undertake. So if, you've got, if it knows there's sort of town work or slow work, it would reserve the electric for there and not use it on the motorway. That's the plan, and it does seem to work actually. So bear with me, I'm just gonna put an address in. Right, it's got it as 146 miles away, 10 miles of queues, unfortunately. I'm gonna alternative route, 148 miles. Yeah, and we're off we go. Now I've set up a display on the dash so I can sort of see what's going on. I've pressed adaptive, you can just about see adaptive on the dash. The light's on because it's a grotty day. Um, and this just gives me a graph of what's going on since the start of this journey. So it's saying we've done an average of 99.9 .9 mpg because that's the max that you can display. Um, we set off on electric but there's a little um, hill just coming out of my village. It started the engine. Um, so MPG plummeted for a moment and it's gone back to electric again as hybrids do. This one I can notice a little bit more when the engine starts compared to the Range Rover but then it's a it's a bigger engine you know you've got a six cylinder three litre uh, twin turbo engine with this against the Range Rover and it's four cylinder two litre and it's just like a little stumble you just hit, you notice it start up if you're trying to note you know sense it and then you see the mpg absolutely come down tumble especially from a cold start because here we are we've gone off set off in battery and then suddenly the onboard computer said oh we need a we need a more power so um it starts the electric uh, the conventional engine up stone cold and is straight into work so it's, yeah i just noticed it suddenly goes to 17 18 mpg and then it cuts out as we're sitting here in silence while the electric motor will just yeah send us on our way okay well i'm just about to get on the m5 we have done 40 miles on this journey and it was well a few miles less than this that range over that p400e had run out of um battery power ev power and here in this bmw bigger batteries i've said 21 um, kilowatt hours usable against 13.4 in the p400e range rover sport 
and I've still got 14 miles of electric left so it's doing this adaptive you know um, setup it's reserving that electric power it doesn't use it all it knows we've still got I think it's 98 miles to go to destination and it's all a bit clever it's all you know advanced clever stuff going in going on inside this car and if I look now so out of we're 41.6 miles now um, it is I have used 20 I've gone 29.3 on electric uh, of that 41.8 and I have averaged 78.6 mpg so far on this journey and it there's two things that have become apparent having run this car uh, for a few days one it really does do well over 40 miles per on a battery charge 44 45 miles is what it does bmw claim 50 and that makes a huge difference on general running around compared to the range rover you really notice it that electric power the other thing i've noticed is it's actually it's not just because of the big battery this x5 uses less electric power per mile than the range rover did can't quite work out how that happens because it's the same sort of weight so there is an efficiency in the drivetrain in the electric motor third generation battery some wizardry going on that means basically this does more miles per kilowatt than other cars of the same weight etc right so i'm getting on the motorway now i say range rover had run out miles from here and i've still got 14 of electric to go and as i say i'm intrigued what it does on the motorway because i think this engine isn't as efficient as the Range Rover and it, how it all balances out. Sitting on the M5 and uh, joined a queue. And then that's the other lovely thing with um, uh, one of these plug-in hybrids is you're in the queue and you're just doing it on electric. But there is something very relaxing about just having pure electric in a queue of cars. I don't know why. You know, if you've got a stop car that does stop start, I just find that sort of start motor grind annoying after a while if you keep doing this but just electric just that seamless step up step off and then just utter silence yeah i think it's the way forward didn't know i'd like you if i'm going to sit in a body queue i want to be in an electric car and that's what you get with one of these okay well we've arrived we've done 152 miles getting here and uh, we have averaged 40.1 mpg and it's done this thing this um, where you press this button of what's it called adaptive where it runs out of ev power as you arrive at the destination that you've set in your sat nav and it's proper clever i think that one I'm surprised, almost the same as the Range Rover did here. The Range Rover was 39 point something, but that had a head start because I'd done a few miles. I think it was average of 68. What I'm finding with this car, it does really well on battery, uh, but as soon as the engine kicks in, you see the MPG go down to teens or something like that. And uh, it's not as economical as that little engine in the Range Rover. But overall, it does the same job. So it just depends how much EV you can do. But it has done 47.1 miles under pure EV power getting here. And I think that's really impressive. Right, I'm off to look at the Espada. And um, yeah, I think next report, I'll be back home and we'll just, just look at it actually on some more Nagety Rose and just get an overall conclusion of what this car is all about. Okay, well, I've been living with this for a few days now. Uh, last time you were with us, we were on that trip coming back from Chester. The time I got home that night, it was over, it had done over 300 miles. I think it was 312 miles, was it? Um, and MPG had fallen right down to sort of 35, 36 MPG, which sort of confirmed what I expected that this 
six cylinder engine isn't the most economical engine in the world, as you'd expect. But the plus side, there's quite a lot of performance, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So now we have done in this car 664 miles in total. And I'm amazed that we've actually done 252 miles on pure electric during that time. So yeah, we got an average of you know, 42.8. And that isn't typical usage because I've had a um, big trip into London, which was well, 160 miles and 300 and something miles up to Chester. So I think in general use, this that would actually be way better than that. But what I've got to like about this car, uh, there's a, there's, it's really quite comfortable and all the buttons sort of make sense and I can't get over the ride. X5s were as tough as anything the first thing and it was always you know a compromised ride for the handling. Right I'm going to go just through the options. I have sport hybrid uh, electric so you can go pure electric on here or adaptive and I've you know you, you saw adaptive when we were going up to Chester. I'm going to put it into sport. Put it into sport it combines those two power sources, the engine and the motor, and uh, it goes a bit nuts, really. Now the engine is running, I can hear the engine running. I've got a rev counter speedo, and let's see what it does. Four, five, five and a half to 60, something like that. Yeah, it gets a proper move on. <laughs> I mean, it's just so weird that you've got this you know very clever car that has been all thought out how it can minimize emissions and run EV but the side effect of having that EV is that instant torque and the supplement you know a pretty healthy engine anyway and you have this performance I think I, I checked seen if anyone had um, figured one of these and there was um, a, a magazine in Germany I couldn't get the name but they they timed it to 100 miles an hour in about 14 and a half seconds. So it's in that sort of genre. It's not, it's not Range Rover Sport SVR league, but it's plenty quick enough to do surprising overtakes and that sort of thing. And yeah, it's on run flats. It's got everything against it for ride quality. And yet that's what I experienced. It's just a nice place to be. So, summarising this car, what don't I like about it? Well, I can't say I love the looks of it. I mean, they're not offensive enough for me not to buy it, but it doesn't have the elegance that Land Rover seems to have at the moment and this sort of king of SUV design in my eyes. This looks slightly clumsy and that kidney grill is like a bit odd, but at least in the shadow line, it's not down, it's not in chrome, etc. So. Yeah, I, I think it's colour sensitive. I don't think being white exactly helps its case. And then I do wonder if that six cylinder engine is overkill. I suppose it goes with the territory, you know, the BMW X5 has always had a performance uh, sporting stance. So I suppose that's why they've done it. But I, you know, having experienced the Range Rover in that four cylinder, you just wonder what uh, BMW we've got in the lineup. Would I actually know to the difference if this was a 240 horsepower two litre engine instead of a 286 horsepower straight six? Don't know, but um, I just wonder if it would be that. That if you're chasing ultimate economy, maybe that's a better um, solution than this, but actually this works really well, so it's a very minor point. Then it, it's slow to charge for some reason, and I don't understand why. Every other plug-in hybrid I've had in an electric car will happily charge at seven kilowatt hours, or, um, but this 32 amps, but this one doesn't. This one charges at 16 amps, 3.7 kilowatts an hour maximum. And it does take a chunk of time to recharge. You're talking about seven hours to charge this up from flat. So it's an overnight charge. You're never going to use a separate charge point you know, when you're out and about because it just doesn't add any miles. If I plugged, I plugged this in when I was up looking at Sparta and after an hour and a bit, I'd done four miles at added range. So it's annoying that it doesn't charge quicker. And also the flipping great key 
winds me up big time. Why does it have to have such a giant key? It has this sort of info on it. It is a, a, an option. But other companies can do that on an app on your phone, and that just seems a better solution. But there's plenty of positives. The first one I'm going to kick off with is the price. This car is 66,000 on the road. Even with all the M um, Sport stuff on it, and the um, trick interior, uh, I'm trying to think what else it's got on it. It's got several options on this. They managed to get it up to 76,000. That's cheap. I mean, it's such a clever car with so much tech, so much space, and so comfortable. It has a Bentley, Bentayga-esque feel to it, to me, from in here. It's beyond Range Rover Sport, certainly, and I think it rides better than Range Rover. Really wasn't expecting that. And then finally, how does it work as a, as a plug-in hybrid? Well, that's where it really scores this car. So I've been thinking, I have a regular commute I do, 41 miles return journey. This is the first plug-in hybrid that I, that can do that range on the one charge. And it just occasionally puts the engine in with some hills or startups, something like that. It's 41 miles. This can do it, 35 miles of those 41 on electric. So there's only 5.8 5 miles, I think it is, it does use in its engine. To so say you do, do that five days a week, um, and then at the weekend you go and visit Grand and a 100 mile journey or something like that, where the hundred, I did a 92 mile journey and it averaged 68 mpg, so 56 I think it did on electric, up time it doesn't recharge and stuff. I mean, remarkable figures. So that would be, if you did that, that's 300 miles a week, 15,000 miles a year. Of that 300 miles a week, 233 would be on pure electric. That's 80% of the running around you would do would be pure electric. That I find remarkable. It would mean on a tank, you, would, you wouldn't have to fill the fuel tank for about, every, you'd fill it every seven weeks or thereabouts. You'd just do 70, no, it's um, 67 miles on fuel a week on your commute. If you 15,000 miles a year would cost you about 3,000 pounds in fuel um, at 30 mpg. With this car, you'll be down to 660 pounds for the year for fuel. And I worked out the electrics, it's about to charge this overnight, it's about two pounds fifty. Um, it comes out at about 780 pounds for the year for a, a electric on top of your 660 fuel. Overall cost, 1,400 pounds a year instead of 3,000. A dramatic saving, but also 80% of your motoring is then pure electric. Doesn't that strike you as a better vehicle than a pure electric and then relying on the charge network around and about? You could, you could do all that as long as you've got a charging point at home. That's the critical factor of one of these cars. There's no escape in that. But I think this is a game changer for the plug-in hybrids. Finally, they've come of age. This is the first one that actually does the range it says it does on the tip. All the others I've tried have been either side of 20 miles and you're forever plugging it in to take advantage of the electric. Not with this car. So I don't think it's hyperbole to describe this as a game changer for the plug-in hybrid division. It's funny how the X5 was the original one was a bit of a game changer for SUV. We hadn't considered a really sporting SUV until that came along. And now here we are with a new generation plug-in hybrid X5 that I think is also a game changer for the division. This is unlike any other SUV. If you wanted to use that a 1440 pounds for 15,000 miles it equates for 15,000 miles you would have to have a car that could average 63 mpg or better to beat that figure and that is what this car is doing that's the game change it's just like when diesel came into suvs suddenly we could afford these bigger cars and now we're getting forced out of diesel what do we turn to next pure electric it's a solution for some people or you go for this plug-in hybrid, 80% of your motoring is then on electric, but no compromises for those long journeys, no thoughts of you have to plug it in on during the journey, and 
it's costing you the same as it would be if you had a car that could achieve 63 mpg over the year that's a big change for the sector and that's why i'm so impressed with this car and i think yeah going forward we're going to see more of these extended hybrid uh, plug-in hybrid cars and they're the right choice for an awful lot of people who have got used to running say a, a diesel SUV and the long range cars and not quite ready to make the jump into full electric. So there you go, bit of a surprise this one, not what I was expecting but um, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you have please subscribe, please press the notifications all that thing because there'll be some more videos coming along very soon. Thank <laughs> you.